tonight. The murder trial begins over the death of 20-year-old bottle shop worker Declan Laverty. Concerns are raised over the approval for Tamborn Resources to drill 15 more wells in the Beedaloo Basin. Police investigate the disappearance of British health expert Michael Mosley on the Greek island of Simi. And the winner of the Archibald Prize is announced with a Yalnu artist also recognised for the Landscape Award. Good evening, Kyle Dowling with a special edition of ABC News. Tonight for State Line, we'll be exploring the phenomenon of Central Australia's Fink Desert Race, sitting down with President Anthony Yoffa ahead of this year's event. Confronting video footage showing the moment 20-year-old Declan Laverty was fatally stabbed at a bottle shop in Darwin's north has been played in court as a 10-day murder trial over his death begins. In opening statements, it was revealed the accused and the victim both used weapons and suffered injuries on the night of the alleged murder. Leaving court surrounded by friends and family, Declan Laverty's mum, Samara, said to give evidence in the murder trial of her own son, emotional after video footage was played to the jury, showing the moment the 20-year-old bottle shop worker was stabbed. Mr Laverty died in March last year while working at the airport tavern in Jingley. The man accused of his murder, Keith Keranawa, is pleading not guilty to the charge, his lawyers arguing he acted in self-defence when he stabbed the victim several times. For the first time since the death, details about the incident were revealed. Crown Prosecutor Marty Ost telling the court confrontation between the two men began when Mr Laverty asked the accused to leave the store because he wasn't wearing shoes. In his opening address, Mr Ost said Mr Keranawa was agitated, threatening to stab Mr Laverty before running to his car and returning moments later with a knife, which he said witnesses described as being the length of a ruler. Mr Laverty also produced a five centimetre cutting blade before the pair confronted each other on the shop floor. Mr Ross told the jury Mr Laverty suffered five stab wounds, including a deep cut into his right chest, which penetrated his lung and heart. Mr Keranawa also suffered two superficial cuts. Mr Ost foreshadowed evidence from eyewitnesses who saw Mr Keranawa laughing and taunting the victim before he fled the scene. Mr Keranawa's lawyer, John Tippett KC, described the Crown's opening as an extraordinary example of selective interpretation of facts and urged the jury to analyse the evidence and the video footage without sympathy. If you look at these videos from a proper angle, you might conclude that in fact Declan Laverty had a knife at head level and took three solid steps toward my client before Keith Karanawa turned to engage him. The trial continues next week. Olivana Lathouris, ABC News. The Northern Territory Government has approved US gas company Tamboran Resources' plan to significantly expand its fracking project in the Beedaloo Basin. It comes just weeks after the government signed a deal with the company to buy its fracked gas to power the Territory. But despite a history of environmental violations, the government says the project doesn't meet the threshold for a more detailed environment impact assessment. Last month, a government celebrating. This is about securing our energy future in the Northern Territory. Today, a government in defence. There are very rigorous monitoring, there's very rigorous um, things in place to keep, um, to make sure, and nobody wants to see our environment impacted. The NT government has approved Tamboran's self-assessed environment management plan to drill 15 more fracking wells in the Beedaloo Basin. The project is expected to use 375 million litres of water each year and will emit more than 170,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions yearly. But the project won't be required to undergo further independent scrutiny. I'm very, very concerned. I think this deserves uh, the appropriate level of scrutiny for a new industry that is already causing heightened community concern. This decision is leaving our kids wondering who the adults in the room are here. Last year, Tamboran was fined over pollution violations and has faced allegations of water contamination. 
But the Chief Minister says there's been enough checks and balances for the gas giant to expand. They've gone through the right processes. They're not being rushed, they're being fully investigated. The critical question for everyone is will Minister Plibersek act, call in this project and have it assessed under federal law? Environment groups are calling on the Federal Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, to pull the so-called water trigger, which would see experts examine the project's impacts on water. The NT government hasn't referred Tamboran yet, but Minister Plibersek says any breaches of environment law will be taken extremely seriously. Roxanne Fitzgerald, ABC News. We apologise for the technical difficulties on that last story. After weeks of sustained pressure, Immigration Minister Andrew Giles has issued a new directive he says will make it clearer that non-citizens with a history of serious crime should be deported, even if they've lived most of their lives in Australia. The opposition says it doesn't go far enough, while New Zealand has continued to express its concern. Fronting up to deliver a new direction. The Australian government expects community protection to be given greater weight when it comes to visa decisions. That signal prompted by criticism of Direction 99, which led to several non-citizens with serious criminal records escaping deportation. We need to give a very clear signal to decision makers that decisions should be made based on common sense. Minister Giles spending weeks defending issuing the direction last year that ensured a non-citizen's ties to Australia be a key consideration in visa cases. Direction 99 making way for Direction 110, the highest priority, the safety of the Australian community, insisting that family violence is so serious it should outweigh other factors and that the impact on victims must be considered. The Direction's contentious section on community ties remains, but it's been stripped back. These are clear, crystal clear directions to decision makers. Not clear enough, according to the opposition. I can't believe that it's taken this long to make such a minor adjustment, which in the end is still going to allow criminals to stay here. But it's a big enough adjustment to cause concern across the ditch, given the original direction was written to address long-held concerns from New Zealand. It's just not right that we think that people have no connection to New Zealand are deported to New Zealand. There are circumstances where it is better for the community and, and certainly for that uh, individual and their children to stay together. The clean-up of the issues stemming from Direction 99 is continuing. The Minister has now cancelled the visas of 40 foreign nationals convicted of serious crimes. There's another 10 visa decisions he'll be closely watching before the new direction comes in on June 21. Whether the changes work the way the government wants them to remains unclear. Monty Boval, ABC News, Canberra. Nine Entertainment chairman Peter Costello featured heavily in discussions at the company's board meeting today following a fresh scandal for the media giant. Allegations Mr Costello assaulted a journalist at Canberra Airport yesterday were strongly denied by the former treasurer. Get, get, get in front and I'll come and talk to you, all right? Oh, okay. yeah, That's a much better way of doing it. Otherwise, you'll fall over each other. Two decades on from setting the agenda in Canberra, former Treasurer Peter Costello, now the chair of Nine Entertainment, is making headlines after this altercation with a journalist. I did not lay a finger or a fist or anything else on it. Like a controversial decision in the footy, there's some guesswork. Sometimes when they're walking backwards, some have uh, the ability to stay upright, others don't. I've known Peter Costello for many years and I've never known or found him to be aggressive in nature. And a rebuke from the current Treasurer. I think it's really important uh, that we treat journalists with respect, uh, that journalists are safe uh, in their workplace uh, and if anyone should know that, it should be the chairman of a major media organisation. But the episode is a symptom of a bigger issue. The Nine conglomerate is dealing with the fallout of the departure of longtime senior leader Darren Wick, who left after serious claims of inappropriate behaviour towards staff. There's already speculation that this could put your chairmanship at risk. What is your response to that? Rubbish. What we're seeing clearly here is the effect of gravity. Not just in the collision of two moving people, but in movement on issues long known about, but not dealt with. 
Changes to workplace law are radically altering how businesses must deal with bullying and sexual harassment. Under the new duty, they're expected to provide a safe place of work. So it's, it, it, instead of waiting for the complaint to come through, which is in a sense acting after the horse has bolted, you've got to prevent that problem occurring at all. Nine Entertainment isn't alone in dealing with difficult issues. A survey of staff in the ABC's news division revealed almost a third had experienced bullying in the past two years. Daniel Ziffer, ABC News. Police on the Greek island of Simi are ramping up their search for missing health expert and wellness advocate Dr Michael Mosley. The British broadcaster did not return after a walk from a local beach and police fear he may have fallen from a height. Australia has this international reputation for being sporty, fit and super healthy. But is it really true? Dr Michael Mosley burst onto our screens with his health advice how to live longer, eat and sleep better, and exercise more efficiently. But he was perhaps best known for his advocacy of intermittent fasting. These sort of foods. Now a land, sea and air search is underway for the broadcaster, who failed to return back from the beach on the Greek island of Simi. Greek police say the 67-year-old left his wife at St Nicholas Beach then set off to walk back alone to his holiday stay in the village of Petty, but never made it. Dr Mosley's wife, Dr Claire Bailey, who often co-hosted shows with her husband, raised the alarm. Local search teams have been beefed up with support from Athens and the search area has been widened. All the rescue teams of the island are looking to find him. With drones, they are all into all the island. Dr Mosley set off in sweltering heat, likely across rugged terrain. But with no trace of the father of four yet, Greek authorities have vowed to keep up the search until he is found. Jenny Lavelle, ABC News. The United States is calling on Israel to be more transparent after a targeted strike on a school building killed at least 40 people. Israeli Defence Force claims multiple Hamas operatives died in the central Gaza attack where thousands of civilians had been sheltering. Devastating grief after a terrifying pre-dawn strike. Dozens of Palestinians, including as many as 14 children, killed in their makeshift beds. We were sleeping when we suddenly saw a rocket falling on us. UNRWA says about 6,000 people were taking shelter at the school in central Gaza. People's remains were scattered inside the yard and outside. The children died while screaming. The Israeli army says it was a precise strike on Hamas militants who were operating there and claims satellite images prove it wasn't targeting sections of the building where civilians were taking shelter. Our intelligence and surveillance indicated that there were no women or children inside the Hamas compound. Attacking, targeting or using United Nations buildings for military purposes are a blatant and disregard of international humanitarian law. This latest attack inside Gaza has prompted an extraordinary intervention by the United States. The White House is calling on Israel to be fully transparent with the public. It's rare for the US to publicly question the credibility of Israel, but it wants the IDF to identify all of the militants it says it has killed in this new strike. Even if the intent is what the uh, IDF has said publicly, that they were trying to use a precision strike, if you have seen 14 children die in that strike, that shows that something went wrong. The escalation comes at a sensitive time for ceasefire negotiations. After eight dreadful months, pressure has never been greater on Israel and Hamas to reach a peace deal. But as the war rages day after day, it's civilians who are paying the ultimate price. John Lyons, ABC News. US President Joe Biden has drawn parallels between Russia's invasion of Ukraine and World War II. Speaking at the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in France, he vowed the United States will not walk away from the conflict. 
The event was attended by world leaders, including Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. A strong alliance 80 years ago and today. US President Joe Biden was alive in 1944 during the D-Day landings on the beaches of Normandy in France, the start of the Allied campaign to liberate Nazi-occupied Europe. We know the dark forces that these heroes fought against 80 years ago. They never fade. Speaking just metres from where more than 9,000 US servicemen are buried and in front of their few comrades still alive, Mr Biden used the moment to reaffirm his commitment to stand with NATO against Russia. And it will not end there. Ukraine's neighbours will be threatened. All of Europe will be threatened. We cannot let that happen. Allied world leaders and diplomats, including Australia's Governor-General David Hurley, are in Normandy paying their respects. Ukraine's Volodymyr Zelensky was also among them. Oh, you're the saviour of the people. Oh, I don't know you. You're my you. Despite being an ally of France during World War II, President Emmanuel Macron did not invite Russia. World leaders are meeting on the sidelines of commemorations as Ukraine seeks a greater role from its allies in its defence against Russia. With the war raging on Europe's border, this D-Day anniversary carries special resonance. We recall the lesson that comes to us again and again across the decades. Three nations must stand together to oppose tyranny. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. Hearing of the sacrifice through the few who survived. Rani Heyman, ABC News, London. Thousands of people are descending on Jowan country in the Northern Territory for the annual Barunga Festival. The event is a celebration of First Nations arts, culture and sport and is the first edition since the voice to parliament referendum was quashed. Our reporter Lillian Rangier is there. Lillian, the celebrations are just getting underway? Good evening, Carl. That's right. Uh, celebrations are just getting underway here on Jawan Country, where we're expecting thousands of people to descend for Barunga Festival. You might be able to see behind me the final touches are just being put on the stage, where in just over 24 hours we'll see Australian icons Yothu Yindi take to the stage, performing their hit song Treaty amongst uh, a wide-ranging set, I'm sure. Uh, of course, this is one of the most politically significant festivals in Australia. It was here in 1988 that Bob Hawke promised a treaty between First Nations people and the Commonwealth in Australia and years on that promise remains undelivered. Now last year the focus was on the voice to parliament referendum but this year it will be a celebration of uh, First Nations excellence in sports, culture, arts um, and a tribute to the late Dr Bush Blanasi who was a land rights activist and champion uh, for First Nations people in the territory most notably as head of the NLC, the Northern Land Council, uh, until his death last year. But his brother Conway says that uh, they'll be carrying on the festival and in continuing to bring together First Nations people across the Territory uh, for a celebration and a learning to carry on their cultures. Thanks, Lillian. For almost 50 years, daredevils from far and wide have taken to the central Australian dust and dirt in the country's roughest and toughest off-road race. Originally filled with Alice Springs locals, the Fink Desert Race now sees an army of interstate competitors join the crowd, racing across the landscape to the remote community of Apachula, there and back again. It's a race that's broken bones, destroyed vehicles and even taken lives. In this Dateline report from Miles Holbrook Walk, we look at what motivates its competitors, the passion and the glory. What possesses a person to take on the deserts? The 
thrills, the challenge, or the glory? The big desert race starts here in Alice Springs. It's a 223-kilometre journey out to Apachula in the first leg. Then, the day after, motorbike riders and car drivers turn around in an intense day of off-road racing. It's a gruelling journey in both directions and leaves many people questioning why anyone would attempt to ride the Fink. Yeah. Jason McMillan is an Eastern Aranda man and this year will be riding in his fifth Fink race. He says it's community that drives him and the chance to be part of a race that runs through his country. Yeah, I feel proud. Like we're racing in the Aranda country and we are Aranda local, yeah. Usually he'd be joined by his grandson Terence, who he taught to ride in the remote community of Ginger Porter. But the young rider has fallen victim to an all too common experience for competitors, injury. Yeah, I crashed on it and I broke my left collarbone. Some are travelling much further to get to the track. Now I'm just going to make sure my bike's in Alice. Danny Foote has one goal on her mind. I've never made the top 50, unfortunately, in the uh, six years, seven years that I've done it. So, um, yeah, that's the aim this year. While motorsport has been a typically male-dominated field, Danny lets her riding do the talking. I think it's cool when they, they get up to the podium and it's me that's on the top step instead of them. While Danny's proud to be racing the Fink, her participation speaks to a broader cultural phenomena important to the race's future. Last year and this year, the number of overall riders dropped off. However, there was an area of growth, the number of women taking part in the Fink. That is considered especially important to the financial longevity and sustainability of the race. But while some ride for passion, others do it for glory, the cream of the crop, those whose achievements are etched into Fink folklore. This year, one rider is chasing a chance to join that group. It's just always uh, something I, I look forward to every year to go camping with family and friends and, and it's just something I always wanted to compete in. Um, never thought I'd be you know, lucky enough to ever be winning the event. A record that stood for almost 30 years there go. Five, five. Randall Gregory. is Randall Gregory's five motorbike wins in a row. You always go better on the way home when you've got a bit of a sniff of that 10,000. When David Walsh won his first Fink Desert race in 2019, he hung the prize-winning bike in his Alice Springs home. Now he could equal his childhood hero's record if he wins this year. Randall Gregory was obviously one of them as a kid. You know, we'd always be out on our bikes at camping at Fink, pretending to be him, riding around. While the achievement isn't the focus for the carpenter by trade, he's addicted to winning. Oh, I mean, it's definitely cool to keep the trophy here in Alice Springs and then, yeah, keep the, everyone's, else, everyone's mitts off the trophy. After 48 years of dust and dirt, whether you're in a car or on a bike, riding on your country or traversing it through to the desert, one thing never changes the punishing desert track. There and back. Miles Holbrook Walk, ABC News, Alice Springs. Bringing thousands of racers and spectators into the centre of Australia for the nation's toughest annual off-road race is no easy feat, but it's a challenge Fink President Anthony Yoffa takes on every year, and it isn't looking like slowing down anytime soon. He sat down with Miles Holbrook Walk about the future of Fink as it head towards its 50th anniversary. Anthony Offer, welcome to Stateline. As president of the great Fink Desert Race, it's near Alice Springs, you've had a lifelong love of motorsports. What draws you to it? I was roped into um, the Fink Desert Race 30 odd years ago by my brother-in-law, who we both had motorbikes and he said, would you like to race Fink? Now he's 20 years younger than me. And I said, why not give it a crack? You've been running Fink since 2002 as president. Uh, what keeps you doing it year after year? Our event was really struggling back in the early 2000s. Um, we were almost insolvent. 
We had mostly competitors from uh, Alice Springs, very few interstaters, uh, virtually no money in the bank and not a high profile. And in order to save the event and grow it, we started to get the message out that you know, the territory is open, the Fink Desert Race is open for interstate riders, in particular we're targeting riders, and we, we turned the Titanic. So we've now gone from 25% interstaters and 75% locals to now 90% interstaters. Let's talk about numbers at Fink. They were down last year. How are they looking in 2024? So we've had a, a, a decline from 2022 by 20% and now another 30% this year. And I put that purely down to what's happening with the economy. Those people that are in their mid-20s to late 30s, that are the ones that the numbers have dropped off from. And I think 13 interest rate rises is the reason behind that. So the impact will be significant on the local economy. But, I mean, we'll get through this and we'll get to the 50th. The challenge for us is what happens in the 51st year. What kind of impact is crime and indeed the media's reporting of crime having on attendance numbers to the race? We had a considerable number of riders saying, we're not going to bring the family this year, we're just going to come ourselves. Um, we think it's unsafe. But I don't think that's the major impact on where we are this year. I'm sure the town has its problems, but we're not going to let the crime issues stand in the way of a highly successful event. There are obvious concerns about safety raised when there was a death of a spectator at the event in 2021. What changes have taken place and how do you think crowds and attendance to Fink has been impacted by that? The spectator attendance hasn't been impacted. There's still, we estimate, 10 to 12,000 spectators that camp along the, the 223 kilometre track. The feedback that we're hearing from car drivers is that with the changes to the spectating uh, rules, a minimum 30 metre distance, and, and over some of the dunes and rises it's out to 50 metres back, uh, is that they feel more confident. Some spectators don't like it. They're used to standing a lot closer or some of their key vantage points are now roped off, but that's the price you pay to keep the race going. In retrospect, was it too dangerous? Was Fink too dangerous a race at that point? All motorsport is dangerous and people need to accept that there's an element of risk and we can't eliminate all that risk, but we've put enhanced procedures in place to mitigate that. The 50th anniversary of the Fink Desert Race is coming up in 2026. How hard is that to believe considering where it all began? I mean, the genesis of this was three people sitting around a table in 1975 to come up with the idea of the, the there and back enduro. As that, that first event drew nearer, I think the committee at the time thought this could grow. So from 56 competitors back then, we've, we've gone to over a thousand competitors in years gone by. Anthony Offer, thank you so much for joining Stateline. Good on you, Miles. It's been a pleasure. And if you want to watch that interview again or any of our Stateline specials, you can catch up anytime on ABC iView. To finance now, and the All Ords has ended its week on a high following a highly anticipated interest rate cut in Europe. Here's David Chow. Well, interest rates are starting to come down overseas, but not here just yet. Overnight, the European Central Bank slashed its rates for the first time in five years. The Europeans have come a long way in their fight against inflation, which has dropped from more than 10% a couple of years ago to now just under 2.5%. Unfortunately, Australia hasn't had as much success with its attempts to ease cost of living pressures. So that's why there's only a 46% chance that the Reserve Bank will cut the cash rate by Christmas while markets are betting, at the other extreme, that the US, Canada and Europe will almost certainly cut rates twice, maybe even three times, by the end of this year. And one reason why Australia is struggling to bring inflation down is that households are still spending big, especially on essentials like healthcare, which has gone up 15.7% in the year to April. No thanks to private health insurance. Unfortunately, it's just not one of those things you can easily stop spending on, unlike fashion and recreation, which is down quite a bit. Meanwhile, the share market rose by half a percent today, and after going up for three days in a row, the All Lords has gained 1.8 percent for the week, which is pretty strong.
And today's best performing stock was IDP Education, which rebounded sharply from yesterday's sell-off. Now overseas, it was a mixed bag with Wall Street flat, Asian markets down and Britain's FTSE a little bit higher. Gold, oil and iron ore prices went up, while the Aussie dollar is buying 66.7 US cents. And that's finance. Crows coach Matthew Nix has urged supporters to stick by the struggling team following their shock eight-point loss to Richmond in Adelaide. Adelaide held a narrow lead going into the main break before the Tigers produced a third-term blitz kicking five unanswered goals to secure just their second win under Adam Uze. The Crows, who were fancy to feature in finals ahead of the season, now sit 10 points adrift of the top eight. Women's top seed Iga Schwantek is through to the final of the French Open at Roland Garros. The pole beat American third seed Coco Goff in straight sets 6-2, 6-4. She's aiming for her third straight French Open title. Shriontek will face Jasmine Paolini in the decider on Saturday after the Italian 12th seed defeated teenager Mira Andreeva 6-3, 6-1. It will be Paolini's first Grand Slam final. Now it's something, you know, it's something crazy for me. I'm really happy, surprised. And yeah, that's the feeling right now. A love of conservation has brought together the winning artist and subject at this year's Archibald Prize. Laura Jones won for her portrait of celebrated author Tim Winton. Her friendship with the man who wrote Cloud Street has helped put the painter on cloud nine. It's a case of fourth time lucky for this year's Archibald winner, Laura Jones. As a little girl in Currajong, I dreamed about being an artist. I've been lucky enough to make that dream come true. Her portrait of prolific author Tim Winton captures his concern for the Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia, an issue the pair bonded over. He thought he looked like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders, but he does. Today we begin on the reef. Winton has been a vocal advocate for the protection of the reef, captured in a documentary released last year. He said about Ningaloo that it's a place that could teach us how to get things right if we just pause a moment and listen. This year also marks a big win for First Nations artists. The gallery received a record number of Indigenous entrants and Aboriginal painters have taken out both the Wynne and Sulman Prizes. It shows the songs of the seven sisters in the stars crying. Now I am crying, but this time with happiness. Hey, hey, hey. The Sulman Prize for genre or mural painting was won by Naomi Kantjirini, accepted on her behalf by colleague and fellow finalist Muna Kuluru. All finalists will be on show at the Art Gallery of New South Wales until September. Sean Tarek Goodwin, ABC News, Sydney. It's time to look at the weather now and tonight's viewer pick of Simpsons Gap has been sent in by John Henshaw. Cool and dry across the NT today. Many parts of the Territory actually experiencing their coldest morning of the year today. It was 28 degrees in Darwin today, 30 in Warramayunga. Looking further out, Catherine 25 today, 28 in Manangrita and Jabiru 29. Top of 18 in Alice Springs, Yulara 19 and Tennant Creek 21. The satellite is showing clear skies across the north of the country. Rain and storms over the east of New South Wales due to a low and some rain over WA as well. Southeasterly winds are being pushed through the NT due to a high over South Australia, bringing cooler and dry conditions, and a low will move away from the New South Wales coast. Interstate tomorrow, partly cloudy in 13 in Hobart, a late shower or two for Melbourne, possible early shower in Canberra, Sydney 21 with a shower or two, sunny in Brisbane, cloudy in Adelaide, and for Perth, 21 with a shower or two. Returning to the NT, a sunny 19 in Alice Springs tomorrow, Tennant Creek sunny in 22 and 23 in Elliott. Heading north, sunny in 27 in Catherine, 25 in Daly Waters, the sunny 26 in Mataranka. And to the west, the sunny 28 in Water, and for Darwin, a sunny 29 tomorrow. There's a high tide just before 7 o'clock tomorrow and the low tide at 12.35. The sun will rise tomorrow at just after 7 o'clock and set at 6.29. Ahead in Darwin, dry and sunny, cool mornings continuing with temperatures picking up from next week. And a cold morning again in Alice Springs tomorrow. Temperatures to start climbing from Sunday. 
And that's ABC News for this Friday night. I'm Carl Dowling. Thanks for your company and good night.